trades. They've happened. We are 24 hours away from the NBA's trade deadline, and a couple of moves have already been made. Let's talk about what actually went down with Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be available for the live trade deadline show tomorrow, Thursday, February 8th at 1 p.m. I'm going to be out due to a tune-up procedure. I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com, and you can find me on Twitter, as always, at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks, the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to PricePicks.com slash LockedOnNBA. Use the code all lowercase LockedOnNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, go and double bang. Really important to double bang at the moment, getting the audio listened to, watching the video, thumbing it up, leaving comments, because of course we are, again, under 24 hours until the trade deadline. Thursday, February 8th, tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern. We're going live with the show, and I am going to be working on some presentation things that I hope work, and we'll see how it all goes, and give you all the information, the analysis, the quick reactions. Now, I'll just give you a quick rundown of what's going to happen over the next two days in terms of shows. I'm not doing a daily look ahead show, a streaming guide for Thursday today. Not doing it. Impot- useless. Because there's going to be players changing teams and all these different streaming options opening up. So pointless for me to do that now. Not going to happen. I usually, on this day, do a second full waiver wire show for the week. Also, not going to do it because the waiver wires that become must add guys right now might change in 24 hours. So I'm not doing that. I wasn't going to do an individual show for the, the trade that happened when I woke up this morning, but then the second one came onto it, so I thought might as well just double up and double bang on the trade. So we are going to do that recap of the two trades. And then tomorrow, there's the full trade deadline show live as it happens. After that, I sit down, make all my adjustments, second think about everything, and then do a full trade wrap-up show, and then maybe do a recap show of Thursday's games. There'll still be a recap show of Wednesday's games tonight. Probably do one of Thursdays, but we'll see how time goes and we'll see how important it is because there might be just weird stuff that goes on that doesn't mean anything because of the deadline. So that is the schedule of events. After this trade show now, there is going to be a show, this is what I plan to do, is go through each team and say the player most likely to be traded. Uh, I think I'll still do that, just not including the four teams maybe that have already made trades, but we'll see. Maybe we do do that. That's a lot of introduction. Um, So let's, let's talk about what we're going to talk about now with those trades that uh, that did go down. We got the first one, which is probably the more important one, and that is the Utah Jazz, the Detroit Pistons. We had Simone Fontecchio going from Utah to Detroit in exchange for a 2024 second round pick, uh, in exchange for starting legend, the fort, Kevin Knox, and um, the international rights to Gabriele Procida who is a player that I really, really liked in the draft a couple of years ago, a sort of bigger shooting wing um, who hasn't come over, who honestly would have helped Detroit already and profiles, I think, as a better Fontecchio, maybe. He's a lot younger, I know that much. But who knows when he's going to come over. I need need to actually have a look at um, what Procida's stats are this season over in Europe. But I think he's a a pretty interesting player. He's playing in Berlin at the moment. So let's talk about... um, the deals and where we go with this from here from a fantasy perspective. And I'll give you the quick tip now where how far into his four minutes in. Yeah, just keep watching a little bit more. I'm not sure this matters for anything, honestly. I'm not sure that any of these trades make any big difference for 10 and 12 team leagues. I am almost, almost certain I wouldn't burn a waiver ad on anything that has happened this morning. And I'll go through why in a second. So there's the trade. Kevin Knox, Prachida, and a second round pick. Goes to Utah, Simone Fontecchio moves out. He goes to Detroit. We'll put the other side up so you can see it as well. So what's... Okay, there's going to be many questions. I don't know all the questions. So the number one question is, is Simone Fontecchio an ad? And I don't think so. And I'll tell you why I don't think so. Yes, he was already starting in Utah, playing 25, 26 minutes a night. He was fine. Like He was okay. He had a little like three, four game stretch of being a 12-team league guy. 
your immediate thought is that um, Fontecchio goes from a team that's pretty good to a team that's bad, so he's going to do more. Maybe. Kevin Knox was starting. True. Yep. So Fontecchio will come in and start in place of Knox, and Knox was playing 16 minutes a night. So number one, there's 16 minutes a night only. The second thing is the only reason Knox is starting is because Isaiah Stewart is out. So do we think that Fontecchio is going to start over Stewart? He should, but I'm not sure that he will. Will he start over Boyan Bogdanovic? No. Um, there's the, the issue with Asar Thompson, which I don't know how that works. And then the the I guess the big thing about all of these deals is that I don't think either of these teams are finished. So whatever they're doing today, the Pistons of the Jazz, with these moves, I don't think that, that means anything's finished. So it's one of those ones where I talk about saving waiver ads because you might say, well, I'm going to add Fontecchio because something's going to happen. But then something else might happen and another player comes in. And the same in Utah. And other guys move out and other guys come in and things are changing still. So I don't think either of these teams are finished. So there's nothing settled here in terms of how these rosters look. Like for this season, Fontecchio is not a top 200 player. But let's look at the last like two months where he's 170th playing 26 minutes a night. 10 and 4, 1.6 assists, 0.8 steals, 46 and 82 with two threes a game. Like just totally mid-production. He could be a 30-minute-a-night player in Detroit. That would require Boyan being traded. He might play 30 minutes a night coming across now, but do you think Fontecchio comes across and takes minutes away from Asar Thompson? I mean, of course he does because it's Monty Williams. But, like, there's no... There's, the, the path isn't as clear for him to do more than the 26 minutes a night he was already playing. Yes, if Boyan is moved out, he might play Boyan's 32 minutes. And that would make him, I think, at best like a fringe player. The way that DeAndre Hunter has always been a fringe player for fantasy. Fontecchio just doesn't have that skill set fantasy profile where it's just all these big usage or he's going to get bigger assists. He's a big defensive guy. He's a huge volume three player. He's just fine. Like He's a pretty good player, but he's fine. So I'm definitely not burned. Like I, there will be a points in the season when Fontecchio, I think, has some value to stream him. But at the moment, the value is because Stewart is out and that's still marginal. And then you're then hoping for a Bogdanovich trade, and you're also then hoping that Assad doesn't step into larger role. And I don't think that's great. On the Utah side of things, well, the immediate thing is, well, Fontecchio has been starting. That means Walker Kessler's going to start now, doesn't it? Not necessarily, no. Because Fontecchio is the guy that replaced Kessler. But the reason that Walker Kessler replaced Fontecchio in the rotation is because of spacing and being a wing. And Kessler still isn't a wing and he still isn't providing spacing. So I think this team has got other moves to make. Now, this, what this, I think, means, and I'll put the Utah Jazz side of this trade back over on the screen just so there's lo their logos here because we're talking about them. What I do, I'll, I'll get back to Pachita in a second. What this does indicate, I think, for the Jazz is that it's a little bit like last season. Yeah, the team's playing well, but we don't care. Like, we will make moves because the Fontecchio fit had been very, very good. Um, we'll make moves. So there are... I think three to four options here in Utah who can fill that spot. But I also think that more moves are coming. I think that Kelly Linick has got to be a chance to be moved. Maybe John Collins, maybe Clarkson. I don't know. I think other things are going to happen. So they can do a couple of things. They could go back and start Kessler. But again, Kessler is rostered everywhere. So I guess the people who have Kessler are just like, man, I hope. I hope he's getting 30 minutes. I'm not much sure that will happen. Maybe it does. But it doesn't impact. It's not rushing to add Walker Kessler because he's on rosters. In points leagues, he may not be, but I'm not even sure how much this changes for him. So we've got to fill that gap. So they could start Kessler, push Markin and back to the three, push Collins at the four. It doesn't appear like Will Hardy has any interest in that, but we'll, we'll see. They could start Kelly Olynyk in place of Fontecchio that pushes Markin and back to the three, but Olynyk gives them passing and he gives them spacing the way that Fontecchio did. He's obviously not a wing and then their wing issue becomes a problem to still. They could start Oshay Abaji, who's probably more of a two, but can play a little bit at the three, but he has been putrid all season and we are definitely not adding Oshay Abaji if he starts. He is a guy that needs probably Markin and out, probably would need Clarkson out, probably would need Sexton out. We need 32 minutes and for them to lose every game by 30 so he can jack up points. Like he's just not a good fantasy player. The other thing that might happen there is, well, do, could they start Kevin Knox? No, no, he's, no, they won't do that. Surely not, right? But we're not adding him either. So the thing is that like, yeah, I could see them starting a Linux. Go, that'd be great. But is he going to be on this team tomorrow? Don't know. Don't think so. He might not be. He could go anywhere. Um, what I do think is interesting here is the absence of the absence of Fontecchio 
means there's probably going to be more for Abaji. We, we, can, we know that. But I do think that there is an opening here with the way that the Jazz have approached this for um, some very interesting things to happen. And I'm going to talk about those very interesting things in just a second. Today's episode is brought to you by the pronunciation legends over at Nissan slash Nissan. Yeah, I'm probably going to call it the way we call it in Australia, so just be ready to adjust because Nissan and Nissan are the same things. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of, did already, lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. It is the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It is perfect for city drives and great escapes. It's got class exclusive Google built in as your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. You don't have to worry about connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. And the 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. They've also got in their incredible lineup, the 2024 Nissan Armada. What, that'll change what you expect from a full-size SUV. A, a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to eight in first-class luxury and style. You can tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com as my buttons don't work. You would never have the problem of the buttons not working in a Nissan, though. That would definitely work. All right, so back to the jazz. So what could this mean? Again, this team's been playing well. Fontecchio is a huge part of it. Kevin Knox does not replace him. Um, so what I think this means is I think this opens up things for Taylor Hendricks. Because if this does mean a further move on from Kelly Olenek, then there's... Pretty big rotation gaps there for Hendricks to get 15 minutes. And then if things start to fake injury their way in March, I think Hendricks will step up. The other thing, which is a massive long shot, Bryce Sensible, who has been killing in the G League, has played about two minutes all season in the NBA. Um, but he's legitimately got the size to play the three. And he's going to be, I feel pretty confident about this, way better than Oshai Abaji. These are ones that you don't make moves on Hendricks and Sensible, but I feel good that Hendricks will have an impact late in the season because of how what this move indicates, that they are still going to sell off and tear down and give these opportunities. As for Sensible, he's averaging 19 points in 29 minutes in the G League, 46% shooting, 37 from three on seven attempts a game, five rebounds, three assists, 1.2 steals. Like that, 31.6 fantasy points in the G League. He'd be good if we got that opportunity. But I'm not sure that's going to happen. But that absence of, like the Fontecchio for Knox swap is obviously you're getting the worst player in Knox. So minutes open up and it does indicate to me more things will happen. So that's just a watch on guys like Hendricks and Sensible. As for those of you in Dynasty Leagues, Gabriela Prochida in Berlin this season has played uh, only 18 minutes a night. He is hitting only 32% of threes. In his uh, pre-draft year, I believe he, what did he shoot from three in his pre-draft year? Playing over in uh, in Italy, yeah, thirty nine percent that year pre draft. But uh, the shooting's been off the last couple of years. He's averaging his numbers are pretty bad actually this season. Now that I look at it, nine points, two rebound, one point six rebounds, one assist, one point four steals is interesting. But he's not playing. He's playing off the bench for Alba Berlin. But he has played in twenty three Euro League games, so that's um, that's good to be able to get those games in for the Euro in the Euro League but not producing at a super high level. He's just a name to watch. He's an interesting player. And I think the Jazz would be able to develop him into something good. He's a 6'7", I think? 6'6", six, 6'6", six, six, six wing, who um, yeah can shoot a little bit. But yeah, we're not going to see him this season. But that's where those sort of things sit to me in terms of where the value goes. Like, I think Hendricks might do something. I think this could boost Olenek. It could boost Abaji, but I'm not burning an ad on it. Fontecchio might get a, sp- a start in Detroit, but that's likely in place of Stewart, and then you're going to need a Bogdanovich trade, then you're going to need someone else to not come back in a Bogdanovich trade, and you're going to need Monty Williams to prefer Fontecchio over Asar Thompson, which is definitely possible. And Fontecchio just doesn't have a re- robust fantasy game. So nothing there you know, strikes me as, well, these are awesome things to happen. The next trade um, was Xavier Tillman moving from the Memphis Grizzlies over to the... Uh, from the Grizzlies to the Celtics in exchange for two second round picks. And then we got a late throw in there of Lamar Stevens, who hasn't been playing in Boston really at all. So let's immediately talk about Boston on this side of things. Uh, Tillman, who's been battling knee problems all season. He 
probably won't have to play every night. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be available. I think some of the knee sauna stuff from him at the moment has been a bit garbage. And I don't think it's because he's been holding out for a trade because that means that the the eight players that the Grizzlies are holding out every night are going to be traded. They are holding guys out to tank. It is not to trade because is Canard being traded? Is Vince Williams being traded? Is Ray Williams being traded? Is Jaron Jackson being traded? Is Derek Rose being traded? Like Everyone's being held out, right? That's not that thing. Tillman is... A pretty solid player. He's an expiring contract, so the Grizzlies gets two second rounders back. Lamar Stevens doesn't really mean anything. Tillman goes there to be the third string center behind Porzingis and Horford. I've already had the question, does this impact Porzingis? No. Does it impact Horford? No. Uh, does Tillman play every night? Not necessarily, because Cornette's been okay, but what it means is uh, Pastel Donata legend, uh, Nemeas Kader, he moves to a role where he just he's not going to play really at all. Tillman's value is gone. Obviously, if you're still holding in 12s, I'm not really sure why, but you're clearly jacking him in a 12-team league, Tillman. Get that garbage out of here! You're dropping in 14, you might hold in a 16, but he's still got to battle Cornette for those minutes. Now, there's going to be, and we've seen this all season, the Celtics are just going to sit, guys. So there will be games where he has the occasional one-game pop-off, the way that Cornette can do it. He'll play next to Horford in some of those games. He is a very good player who I think has been horribly misutilized by the Grizzlies this season. I've said that all year. And I think he's going to be... It's actually a massive, massive W for the Celtics to get a player who can play in the playoffs, can provide depth in the regular season, and you give up nothing really to get him. It's a huge W for Boston. Memphis has mismanaged Tillman all season. Remember, he was their starting center in the playoffs and was fine. Like He was all right against um, Anthony Davis in the playoffs. Wouldn't say he was awesome, but it's Anthony Davis. He was fine. And they just mismanaged him all season. So now the thing is, the question goes like, well, man, there's huge winners in Memphis now. And I'm not certain that's true either. Are they finished making moves? And I'll tell you why I'm not certain. Well, the number one thing is, well, man, this means it's awesome for Santi Aldama. And I cannot express to you enough how much I don't understand what is the love with Santi Aldama. Why is everyone on this man's nuts? I was probably... Not to you know, toot my own horn, I'm not that flexible, but not to go go and say that, yeah, I'm the best because I was probably the first one that was on Santi last season to go, hey, this guy is going to start with Jaron out. You might want to take a flyer, right? That's what we said, and he was fine, and then he moved to the bench and he was not very good. But look, what's he done this season? I go and ask you to check out the box scores because Tillman hasn't been playing, like literally at all, the last two games, and Santi's not blowing up. He's not playing huge minutes. He played 24 minutes or whatever last game. He's still a fringe player. And Tillman's absence doesn't make Aldama this guaranteed must-roster guy. This team is still going to be moving guys around all over the place. So it is totally okay if you want Aldama. But I don't think this changes gigantic amounts because the reliability of him and this team and the injuries is not there. He will get... Some, look, there are The last two games we have seen this team without... Xavier Tillman. We have seen it many times all season. And Santi has not done anything to suggest that he is going to blow up. This could all change. Maybe they do decide now, well, we've moved off of Xavier Tillman, so Santi's going to play 30 minutes every single night. I'd be pretty surprised if they did that. But it could happen. But what I know is I'm not burning an ad on Aldama right now to think that that will happen because it hasn't. The other one that I've got is, well, this is a huge time for Gigi Jackson. Again, is it? Tillman didn't play last game. What did Jackson do? 21 minutes? Maybe it helps the floor a little bit. But I'm not even convinced of that. I still think we are going to get shenaniganized with this team all the way through. And Gigi is going to have big games. He's going to have bad games. I don't think he's going to be reliable enough as a 12-team league guy all the way through. I really like Gigi. He's super young. I think he can develop into a good player. But... The peripheral stats aren't always there. The efficiency is going to be whack. The minutes are going to be up and down, so are the shot attempts. It is, it is really important to note that Tillman has not been playing. And barely, hasn't started for a while, but he has not been playing. So we saw the last couple of games without Tillman, and it didn't do anything to really change the evaluation of GG at all, I don't think. But that's what I mean. More stuff can happen. More deals might go down. We might get more injury stuff going on. We see they've ruled Jaron out for the season or they're fake injuries. Santi Aldama's a possibility too. And then GG plays 30 a night rest of season. Totally possible. But 30 minutes a night of GG Jackson, does he become like big Jordan Clarkson where he's like, I'm not even sure I want to roster this guy? That is possible too. 
because he shoots 36% from the field, scoring 18 points. And some of you will know that that's what Clarkson does. And for some of you, that's good. And some of you, it's not rosterable. So that, that could happen too. The next one is like, man, this is great news for Trey Jameson. And I say, yes, yes-ish. But Trey Jamison is on a 10-day contract. So we need a couple of things to happen. We need the Grizzlies to say, we love you, Trey Jamison, 24-year-old rookie, who played, he played two games for the Wizards this season, I think it was, as well. And last game, really good, 32 minutes. He looked really good. Well, not really good. He put up good numbers, let's put it that way. Um, they have to convert him to a full-time contract, which I don't think they will because they want to use that roster spot to convert GG Jackson to a full-time contract. And then you need Trey Jamison to be converted to that contract. And then you need him to be the starter, meaning Jaron Jackson doesn't play again. And I don't think that that's realistic either. Yes, I think Jaron is going to get shut down at some point this season, but there are, they are two situations you need to happen. You need Jamison to be converted and you need him to be a starter instead of Jaron Jackson or next to Jaron Jackson, which would mean that your mate Santiago Dharma moves to the bench and GJ Jackson's role is limited. So it's all like, there's just a bunch of different things that can happen, but is uh, the guy who's got the best chance of getting value out of this is Jemison because he can block some shots, he can have some good field goal percentage, he can be a rebounder. But I, I don't feel any level of goodness about him being a 27-minute a night player rest of season. They honestly might just be like, sorry, mate, you're 10 days up. Thanks for your time. Let's bring the next bloke in and see what he's able to do. So I, again, I wouldn't burn an ad on Trey Jemison at this point. As weird as that sounds, again, because... I just don't know where it sits. This is not like a very clear, you have got the clearest path of all time here. It might seem like that, but I'm not fully convinced of that. Today's episode is also brought to you by our Demon Time Legends Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS as well. It's just you against the numbers. You pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and you watch the winnings roll in. It is demon time on prize picks. Now, if you go and look up the definition of demon time, it probably doesn't quite match what prize picks um, is offering, which again, I'll let you go and Google what demon time means. But demon time on prize picks means you can win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks that can turn $10 into $1,000. They've got demons and goblins as the newest and most exciting way to play at prize picks. Squares marked with red demons or green goblins. Norman Osborne's get you different payouts. You can win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types. That's what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. Use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. That is prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. The code is locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It is that easy. Okay, so to wrap these trades up, who are the winners? And I say this with a heavy dose of skepticism. And by winners, this doesn't mean they're ads. It means the guys, I think, get an increase. And this might, you, you might say, Josh, you just said that this isn't worth adding. Yes, winners and worth adding are, are quite different. Trey Jemison is undoubtedly a winner because it gives him more of a path to maybe get himself onto the roster and maybe be in the rotation as a center because Tillman, who was a center, is not there. But it doesn't mean that it's going to happen or that he's going to be a 30-minute-a-night player because I don't think that happens. I think there'll be stretches of it. Is it a win for Santi Aldama? Yeah, it probably is. But is it enough for me to feel super confident in him? Not really. Is it a win for Gigi Jackson? Yes, the floor gets boosted of these guys. But with a team that might sit them every second game or play 20 minutes versus 30 minutes, I don't really care about that floor. Like That makes it very, very tough still to predict what this rotation is. I think Walker Kessler's also a winner, but it might not be enough. Losing Fontecchio means maybe they do have to play more Kessler and Collins together, or they don't. And Abaji moves into that role. They call up Sensible. They call up Hendricks. So Abaji, I think, is almost 100% a winner. He's going to have to play more. I feel, I feel, and that's going to make them way worse because he has been atrocious. One of the earliest like significant fights I remember having uh, on social media or on YouTube comments was my me arguing with someone about Abaji, who I said, look, this guy's just not a good prospect. I, I don't like it at all. And then this guy just going in. What are you talking about? He won National Player of the of the Year, College Legend. How dare you? you got no idea. He's going to cook. He's going to be awesome. Okay, yeah, cool. Like 23-year-olds who win National College Player of the Year. 
a Tyler Hansburg and Jimmy Fredette. Like, they're not good in the NBA. And this guy just getting on and on and on. We just went at it for months. Um, that guy doesn't comment about Osho Abaji anymore because he's not very good. And again, he might have a stretch. He had a little bit of a stretch at the end of last season when they cleared everybody out. And they said, all right, O'Shea, go out there and cook. And they lost every game because he's bad. So look, he might become that guy, not adding him. Taylor Hendricks probably gets some boost as well. I think Kelly Linick might get a boost, but he also literally might be on a new team tomorrow. In fact, by the time I finish recording this or the time you listen to this, Kelly Linick might not be on this team. So I'm not going to list him as a winner. The losers, I think it is fairly clear that Tillman is a loser because he had a chance to play 26 a night. They probably weren't going to do it in Memphis, but he's got no chance of doing that in Boston unless an injury strikes. Luke Cornett is also a loser. He was getting those occasional spike games and now he'll have Tillman to battle for that. And I've listed a couple of Pistons guys here. Uh, Asar Thompson, Isaiah Stewart. There is a possibility that they are both losers. Fontecchio coming across replacing Kevin Knox as either 13 minutes or zero minutes means that somebody is probably in the rotation like Fontecchio can play more. It should, it should on a normal functional team, mean that Stewart doesn't play uh, much power forward. But who knows? Again, they're still going to make moves. But if they don't, adding a Fontecchio into that small forward mix impacts Stewart because it means Boyan plays more at the four. It impacts Asar because it's Monty Williams. And while we think that, wow, losing Kevin Knox means a huge boost for Asar, I actually think it's a downgrade because Knox played 15 minutes and Fontecchio might play 25. I don't think, I think it's relatively neutral for Fontecchio. I think those 25, 26 minutes, maybe it becomes 28 in Detroit, but also maybe it's less because maybe they do play Boyan and Stewart together and Fontecchio comes off the bench and then maybe Boyan is traded and Fontecchio steps up. Like it's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening that I think is still going to be reversed or changed tomorrow without having a huge impact on fantasy. But you know what I do want to know? I want to know what you guys think. Like, how do you view this trade? Am I way off? Are you going to with a standard four-man uh, or four-ad limit for the week, would you burn one on Fontecchio? Would you burn one on Asar Thompson? Would you burn one on Gigi Jackson or Santi Aldama? I wouldn't. Would you burn one on Trey Jemison? I wouldn't. I would consider Trey in like a 16-teamer. And those other guys like Fontecchio's 14 or 16, but he's probably already, already rostered. I think a lot of this stuff is relatively neutral and we'll get some interesting things happen later, maybe with a Jamison, maybe with a uh, Hendrix, maybe with Sensibor, uh, maybe a Baji, like in a 16-team league. That's where we sit. But I want to hear what you guys think. Uh, weird trades to wake up to. Still pretty confusing, to be honest, about what direction the Jazz are going. That's probably the more interesting thing is what are the Jazz doing? Where are they going from here? Are they doing the same as last year where the players who are functional helping them win are getting shipped out? Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, the thumbs up, and go and pre-bang over on the live trade deadline show. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.